The Lord be with you. As we gather to worship in various places, may we be blessed by God who forms us in word, sacrament, and community. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Stephen Weber from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Cambridge, Ontario, and I'm glad to have you join us this day. As we prepare to return to in-person worship at a date yet to be determined, we have need of additional video operators. You need to be able to read and follow written directions, have basic PC operation knowledge, plus be comfortable using an app on a tablet. Essentially, you simply need to be able to push the indicated button on a tablet, selecting that indicated button from about a dozen buttons pictured on that tablet. In-person instruction will be provided. Please let me know that you can help in this way. We are using this system for the first time today in a trial run. Thank you to our Minister of Music, Katrina Lowell, and her mother, Karen Peters, for playing and recording a prelude and postlude for us this day. Well, it's election time, and our faith has implications for how we vote. Our National Bishop, Susan Johnson, along with the National Bishops of the Anglican Church of Canada, have written a letter to congregations about recent events that might need to be taken into consideration when casting your vote. The events include finding the remains of more than 1,300 Indigenous children buried in unmarked graves, the murder of George Floyd, and the many incidents of racial hatred in Canada. The United Nations International Government Panel on Climate Change and the Global Climate Crisis, human trafficking, along with the need for affordable housing, a guaranteed basic income, justice in Palestine and Israel, human rights in the Philippines, and the dignity of human beings of all sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. This letter from our bishop can point you to more information on any of these issues. Our democracy depends upon an informed electorate, and I encourage you to find out all that you need to know so that you can cast your vote intelligently and based on your faith values. The link to the entire letter can be found on our Facebook page as well as in the bulletin. At whatever time and location you are accessing this, thank you for doing so. It is good to be together in whatever way possible during this time of physical distancing. We continue now with worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I am so very glad that you're here today, and I know that you're bringing sunshine and joy wherever you are. Did you know that when you were baptized, an invisible sign was marked on your forehead in oil? Maybe you remember your own baptism, but if not, perhaps you can recall seeing someone else being baptized. Maybe then you know what that sign is. Well, when we are baptized, the pastor traces a cross on our foreheads. It's marked in oil, because in Bible times, when someone was given a special job to do, they would have oil poured over their heads, and that would proclaim to everyone watching that God had chosen that person for a special job. So in baptism, when that sign of the cross is marked on our foreheads in oil, it means that everyone who is baptized is given a special job from God. Pretty neat, eh? Now that special job varies from person to person, because God knows us, and God uses our unique talents and abilities to fulfill that special job. But whatever it is, it always involves sharing God's love. 
So what I'm inviting you to do today is to trace an invisible cross on your forehead like this as a reminder that you have been chosen by God for a special job. Child of God, you have been marked with the cross of Christ forever. If you or someone you know isn't baptized but would like to be, please speak to me and we can begin that process. Now I invite you to move into your favorite prayer posture. It may be hands open, facing up, to receive the, God, the gift of God's presence in prayer. It may be hands folded, head bowed, and eyes closed to help you concentrate. Or it may be crossing your arms across your chest to form an X, the first letter of Christ in Greek, and it feels like a hug from God. Now let us pray. Dear God, thank you for gifting us each with special talents and abilities. Help us take up our cross and use these gifts to share your love with others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Your parents have children's bulletins for you that you're welcome to work on at any time, even while you're listening to the sermon. All across Canada, bishops and assistants to the bishops of our Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada have agreed to prepare sermons, and I think this is a terrific way for us to get to know other Lutherans from across Canada, for us to remember that we often need the help of others, and that together we can do far more than we could do alone. Today's sermon, the final in the series, has been prepared by National Bishop Susan Johnson, a former member of St. Paul's, and she'll be preaching in many of our congregations this morning. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he strictly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man was undergo great suffering, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And greetings to you from you siblings in Christ from coast to coast to coast that make up this family of God that we call the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. I have often struggled with this text, um, and let me share with you a little bit why. It's really verses 34 and 35. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to, to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. 
take up your cross. Um, it certainly doesn't seem like a pleasure cruise, does it? Um, maybe I'm a little chicken sometimes, but I don't really think that's what bothers me about this text. I think what bothers me is the way sometimes that it's been misused. One way is it's been misused is some people think that this call to take up your cross is a call to martyrdom, a call to die as part of your faith. And I believe very strongly that is not the case. We do lift up and honor those who have been martyred for their faith, faith because of the example of their discipleship and their commitment to live a life following Jesus. But we never celebrate their deaths. We mourn their deaths and we mourn because of the oppressive systems that they lived in that call, caused their persecution and death. I think um, we also recommit ourselves to work to end the oppression um, and injustice in our world in response to the example of the martyrs. I think that this um, gospel also gets misused by those who would preach a uh, gospel of prosperity because they define taking up your cross in a very specific way, namely to live a very pure and moral life so that in return you will be reward, rewarded with riches here on earth as well as in heaven. If you color within all the lines, that you will um, be rewarded with wealth and health and a good job and a great family and promotions and who knows what else. And that's not right. That is not what the gospel promises us. In fact, I think it's heretical. Another way that it gets um, twisted, I think, is by the misuse um, to in our society sometimes to try and use what sounds like a hard road to water down than what the expectations of Christianity are um, to some kind of Christianity life, Christianity light. And that is certainly what not, not what God is calling us to. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a martyr in the faith, has written about this in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, and I just want to read one very brief passage. If our Christianity has ceased to be serious about discipleship, if we have watered down the gospel into emotional uplift, which makes no costly demands and which fails to distinguish between natural and Christian existence, then we cannot help regarding the cross as an ordinary everyday calamity, as one of the trials and tribulations of life. We have then forgotten that the cross means rejection and shame as well as suffering. And indeed, that is very much what Jesus experienced. I think the call to take up our a cross, take up our cross and follow Jesus, is a call to discipleship. And I think it means living life through the filter of loving God and loving one's neighbor. I think this is what we're called to do in all aspects of our life, in our work, in our volunteer time, in our church community and our wider community in how we care for the earth, and how we spend our money, and how we choose to use our time, and the choices we make about purchasing or not purchasing, all of these things, everything that we do in our life needs to come through the lens of that filter. Jesus gave us many examples of people who lived costly lives of discipleship. Like, for example, the story of the widow who went into the temple and gave her all, her one mite, which was a very small coin, but all she had for praise and honor and love of God. Or the story of um, the woman who lost coins. No, the woman who lost one coin out of several coins and searched and searched and searched until she found it. And then she was so ha happy about finding the lost coin that she threw a big party and invited her neighbors to celebrate with her. In the end of trying to save that one coin, she spent a whole bunch of money on throwing a party. It's in a sign of both uh, our call to seek for those that are lost, um, 
both in terms of their, their physical needs and, and their emotional and spiritual needs, but also to, um, to be lavish in our hospitality. Or the wonderful story about the father who receives the return of his son who has gone rogue or prodigal um, and welcomes him with wide open loving arms and forgiveness and hospitality and generosity who places a robe upon him and a ring on his finger and uh, throws him a party and promises him more because he's so happy his son is alive and back with him. Now, the son wasn't entitled to that. He'd already received half of his father's estate, what was owed to him. But this is the sign of God's working and God's ways, the cost of discipleship. Or the story of the Samaritan man who found the Jewish man who had been beaten up on the side of the road and attended to his needs and took him farther to a place where he would be taken care of and paid for that care. It's going that extra mile, and all that we do in life. I'm not saying the life of discipleship is easy. It's challenging, and it's a muscle that we need to exercise and grow into. That's why we're doing this four-year emphasis on living our faith. We've spent three years really focusing on strengthening our relationship with God, because that is what is going to help us get to year four. So in year one, we looked at prayer, and in year two, we looked at reading scripture, and right now we're starting a year of focusing on our devotional life and our worship life. But in year four, a year from now, we'll be looking at how we live out love and action in all aspects of our lives. Taking up your cross is not always easy. It sometimes means being willing to take a stand that is not popular and receiving criticism for it. It's being willing to stand up for the classmate who's being bullied in school, or to speak for the co-worker who's being harassed or um, subject to microaggressions because of gender or um, gender identity and expression or sexual orientation or race or ability or lack of ability. Um, or differing in ability, I mean, um, it's, it's being willing to, um, to do costly decisions, to maybe give something to that person who's going by your car yet one more time with a hat out, or to volunteering at a food bank, or to say, maybe we don't need a new car this year and let's use the money that we would have spent in terms of helping with this or that. Or it means carefully thinking about your values and what's important in your life as you prepare to vote in this upcoming federal election. It's about how we live all aspects of our life together and there are consequences to those actions. I read a tweet um, maybe just last week and um, it was by someone named Carlos A. Rodriguez uh, and I've never seen one of his tweets before but this really struck me. He said, there are no conditions on love thy neighbor. There are no addendums to welcome the stranger. There are zero amendments to the golden rule. And if we're wrong, let's err on the side of inclusion and love, always love. The reality is that we are marked out for this life of discipleship, this life of taking up our cross to follow Jesus in our, in our baptisms right at the start of our life of faith. So we are, an, um, we are splashed with water three times in the name of the Trinity. We are then signed with the mark of the cross of Christ on our foreheads and then anointed and sealed with the Holy Spirit. But that marking with the cross means something. It's right here on our foreheads. It's, it's where we lead from, where we walk out from. And we don't always remember it. We don't look at it. We don't see it when we look in the mirror, but maybe we should. It's what we are called to do. It's what we are called to be, disciples. The good news is 
that, um, first of all, we are not alone in this. Um, we know and we are promised that God is with us always in our joys and in our sorrows. At times when carrying that cross gets really difficult. And we know that we have been called into a community that the, the faith community that surrounds us is there to help us discern uh, where and how Christ is calling us, both individually and then together, but also to help us when things get difficult to bear the burdens and to continue to follow Jesus. So that means the world to me, and I hope it means the world to you too. But perhaps, well, not perhaps, but even more so. Um, you know, at the beginning of this lesson, um, Peter sort of becomes a hero at the beginning and says, um, you are the Messiah. And in other places, along with that, Jesus says, yes, you're faithful and on you all. I will build your church, my church. But the reality is that, you know, just a few minutes later, here's Peter rebuking Jesus for prophesying about his death and suffering and resurrection. And Peter, we know, goes on uh, when Jesus is arrested to deny him three times. But Peter still is a foundation on which Christ builds his church on earth. Christ knows that even though we are called to take up our cross and follow Jesus, that we will inevitably stumble. And the thing is, we are in a covenant relationship with God which will not change when we stumble or when we falter or when we get scared or when it's too hard or anything. God loves us unconditionally and promises us life abundant now and into the future. And again, that promise that we will never be alone, that God's presence is always with us, surrounding us and supporting us. So let's take courage from these things and let's strike out again in terms of taking up our cross and following Jesus. You know, this really isn't such a scary passage after all. God bless you in your journey of discipleship. Amen.
made children and heirs of God's promise. We pray for the church, the world, and all in need, saying, Lord, in your love, and responding, hear our prayer. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your loving, caring presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Creating God, you brought life into being and called it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Move us to lower our carbon emissions and to care for those hurt by the global climate crisis, especially the poor. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma themselves. Help us each to consider our faith so that we vote in ways that are pleasing to you. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Transforming God, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Loving God, you call us to care for all people. As our municipal government considers the location of a new consumption and treatment site for Cambridge, Create timely and caring decisions that foster the common good, save lives, and recognize your love for each and every one of us. Bless the work of all who, are help, who help in providing vaccinations. Move us each to do our part in following the guidance of our public health authorities so that our health system does not become overwhelmed. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your embrace. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace. Receive the blessing. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Oh
go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God.